Hello all, Rick here. Throughout Star Trek, we have seen multiple instances where the Federation studies other cultures before first contact is established, from Bronze Age societies to those on the cusp of developing space travel. In accordance with the Prime Directive, they take every precaution to remain hidden while doing so, to avoid alerting them to the presence of superior technologies and other life forms from beyond their planet. To this end, they have developed a number of different methods to covertly pass among and observe others, and in this video I aim to look at them from their earliest attempts within Starfleet. The first and safest method of covert observation that Starfleet will choose is simply observation from a distance. We put out a lot of noise into space with our radio waves, and these would be detectable, and that is true for Trek. Throughout the Federation's history, the organization's first alert to another culture that remains planet-bound is often when they pick up transmissions and the noise generated by a civilization. These signals and broadcasts often provide insight into a culture. From this alone, a large amount of data can be gathered about a species. If the cultures in question also possess some form of subspace communications, then their range may be even further. Although, in these instances, it is likely that they can also intercept other alien broadcasts and comm traffic. This was the case with the Trill in Apocrypha, which developed subspace tech before the warp engine, and therefore learned of alien life through their own eavesdropping. Alternatively, the Federation may stumble across a planetary culture when they are scouting M-Class worlds, identifying promising systems from a distance and only reading life forms and civilization when they close in. In either case, Starfleet then gauges their level of technology and the means that the planet has of identifying an interstellar craft before beginning to take numerous scans of the planet. Federation sensors are incredibly accurate and detailed, except when the plot demands that they're not. And depending on the safe observable distance, this is generally enough to build a detailed look at a planet's populace. If a culture has the means of spotting them, however, then generally the Federation will take precautions to stay out of an observable range, or deploy a smaller craft. Sometimes, however, it's not enough to simply watch from orbit, and Starfleet needs to access the planet's surface to study. In these cases, automated drones could be deployed. However, such constructs are not as able to adapt or improvise. On top of this, Starfleet generally attracts those who want to explore and experience for themselves, so there is going to be the added allure of going there in person. The Vulcans, and many other future UFP members, would travel down to pre-warp planets to conduct studies and try to maintain a distance from civilization to mitigate discovery. However, sometimes they would have to go to a population centre and interact with the locals. In these instances, disguises were key. Fortunately, the basic humanoid form is very common in the Trek galaxy, thanks to the progenitor species that seeded that form in primordial DNA. And the preference for oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere is equally frequent. Temperature tolerances are more varied, however, and can sometimes pose an issue. The first disguises were quite simply makeup. Cosmetics and prosthetics are often enough to alter an appearance and will stand up to casual scrutiny. The advantages are the ease of application and removal, at least in science fiction, but there is a higher chance of discovery as such false appearances are easily damaged or removed under inspection. Despite the development of further technologies, the simple method of literally slapping on a false skin, forehead or pair of ears remains. This, coupled with the appropriation of attire to blend in, and you have a simple way of disguising yourself. If a planetside visit was for a longer duration, or continual proximity to the locals was to be expected, then a more robust disguise was needed. In this instance, a medical officer capable of cosmetic surgery was required. Using the far more advanced medical science of Trek, a surgeon could implant new structures, alter bone shape, change skin pigmentation and patterns, and all manner of other modifications, as well as add or remove hair. The changes were far more likely to pass inspection, 
and were permanent alterations to the away team in question, but nothing a dermal regenerator could not fix and be undone with no scarring. This option, however, was only skin deep, as an observer's internals and anatomy were not altered in any way, which can still lead to complications if an away team member sustains heavy injury and is unable to return to their ship. Likewise, a thorough scan, either via surgery, x-ray or some other detector, would reveal the likely anatomical differences. For most of the time, however, this was the go-to method of creating disguises from the 22nd to 25th century. We also see the use of holographic shrouds and masks that cast the image of a different appearance over the wearer, but these were not often deployed outside of spycraft, probably for the risk of not only a cursory inspection revealing the hologram, but then the contamination caused by having that technology discovered. Still, they existed, but I don't really see a benefit for these over other options when it comes to Starfleet's style observation protocols. The 23rd century saw the introduction of short-term gene alteration that would create a mutagenic compound that when introduced would cause the body to rapidly rewrite itself and take on the characteristics of another species for a limited time before the changes wore off. This falls into the zone of genetic engineering under the Federation, and would therefore be intensely scrutinised, but as no permanent augmentation was conducted for the benefit of societal gain, I guess it was authorised. This is by far one of the better ways to pass unnoticed among another species, even one that is capable of invasive scans, and that has a high degree of technological advancement. The downsides to this are pretty steep, however. For starters, everyone is different, so a disguise made in this fashion would need to be a specialised cocktail for every away team member, and the transformations could be painful without anaesthetics. Eventually, the alterations would wear off too, and the natural genome would reassert itself, but for the duration, it was a stable and thorough cover. Sometimes, the Federation would need a more permanent way to station people to observe a civilization, and in these cases a hide was created and hidden. Such bases were there to provide a base of operations on the planet, a point to which you could safely beam in, and they could be placed just about anywhere using discrete transporters and holographic displays. A ship could target an unassuming rocky mound and beam it out while at the same time beaming in holographic emitters to recreate the illusion of the feature it just removed. From that hidden point, a simple observation post could be constructed within the shrouded area, whether by hand or by some form of fabrication technology. These hides, or duck blinds, served Starfleet well, but the only time we are made aware of them are the stories in which something goes wrong, as it did with the Mintakans or the Baku because a story where everything goes as planned is less interesting, but you know what? I'd still watch it. The dangers of this method of covert observation are obvious. If discovered, it is a huge reveal to an otherwise unsuspecting culture. With the Baku, we see an evolution of this technology to a greater degree, with not only a holographic hide directly over their main settlement, but emitters angled in such a way that they could project across the entire village. This was so that Starfleet observers could don special holographic containment suits, and the projectors of the hide could cast their images over the suits, hiding them from plain sight too. This was sort of like a person wearing a green suit against a green screen, and by sheer technicality was not cloaking. So that should have kept the Romulans happy. This was a very risky setup that, although yielded greater results, was preferable for a community where saying that you were just a visitor from out of town wouldn't cut it. The disadvantages are numerous. First off, it is all reliant on the Hyde's holographic projectors, so if they fail, all observers are revealed. Secondly, if the suits are damaged, then the projectors will not cover the vulnerability. And finally, it does nothing to hide your physical presence, so someone could literally walk into you. I guess you would also have to steer clear of gravel, sand, water, snow. 
This one actually is not great and would only see use in very specific circumstances, I think. So there we go. These are the methods Starfleet and the Federation use to observe other civilizations in secret, and I have to wonder how many of these were developed originally for intelligence agencies and the like. The general rule seems to be that Starfleet will adopt whatever method is most needed with the least amount of hassle. Cosmetics for a quick visit at a distance, full gene alteration for a more advanced species that employs thorough scans. The Federation is not the only organisation that engages in such research, although they do seem to put more effort and care into not upsetting the local balance than other species, like the Klingons, for example. Except when they don't, which happened a lot in the 23rd century, it seems. Thanks for watching this video, and if you like Trek or science fiction related topics, feel free to check out what else I have or suggest some more ideas. I've been Rick, and I'll see you again later. Goodbye.